Hello and welcome back to Catapult Your Career, where we delve into the reality of various careers and explore practical advice for numerous professions. Um, and today we are diving into the world of uh, physiotherapy, uh, as well as uh, kind of golf physiotherapy. Uh, and I have none other uh, than a good friend in Amanda Yardley, who's a physio at the Physio Rooms and Free Rivers Golf Club. So uh, thanks for coming, Amanda. Thanks for inviting me along, Michael. Look forward to our chat. Good, good. Nice. And and I, I know uh, Amanda very well because uh, I myself have been a numpty and got myself injured uh, <laughs> at the via golf and stuff like that. <laughs> and so I know Amanda well uh, in terms of helping me get back to kind of full fitness as well. Um, but yeah, it'd be a really interesting one here. And, and I think you, what we're kind of dive into a little bit and very soon is your own career and how you've transitioned careers as well. So just to kind of start us off, Amanda, give us a little bit of a, a background to, to what you've done perhaps, and we can start to talk about where you are now in terms of your, your current role. Okay, so I actually started out on a business and finance path, career path, when I was 18. So I did a business and finance degree. Um, but even at that point, I was torn between a business and finance career and a physiotherapy career. Mm -hmm. um, and I listened to my parents' wishes and followed the business path first. Yeah. Um, and then I worked in the city in insolvency and business restructuring for 18 months but really deep down I knew that I wanted to be doing physio instead um, so I made the decision to leave the city life and go back to university to do mm -hmm. a conversion degree to physiotherapy um, so there's loads of different routes in which I'm sure we'll cover later but I was lucky enough to be able to do a conversion course because I had a BSc degree already yeah um, so yeah, I did that. And then 13 years ago, I qualified as a physio mm -hmm. and set out on my career, which was initially in the NHS, which was typical for when I qualified. Um, and I worked in an acute hospital setting. So at Broomfield Hospital, very typically, we go through all of the junior rotations in different areas of physio. So respiratory, neurology, orthopaedics, outpatients. People often forget that physios work in other areas and not just sports yep. injury. So yep. we start off doing everything. Um, and then in 2011, I decided to specialise in outpatient care. So sports injuries or the typical injuries. Um, and then in 2012, I first started working with private clinics and sports injuries and more sports team related things. Um, and then as of 2020, I became solely private clinic based. Mm -hmm. And that's when I also then did my golf specialist qualifications. Um, and that came about because I already treated a lot of golfers um, and I really enjoyed treating golfers. And at that point in my career, I needed something new, a new challenge. Um, and there was various specialities I could have picked. But actually, uh, a golf pro that I was treating at the time said, had I considered the golf medical pathway? Um, and I looked into it and it's actually really fascinating and a real mixed bag of things. So I thought, well, that's what I'll go with. Yeah. So I did that in 2020 and then have been working in both normal like outpatient MSK clinics and a golf role since then. So the last, yeah, two to three years in both nice. industries. Nice. So, yeah. Amazing. It's I mean, going I mean, well. It's, it, I mean, thank you for like giving us that kind of walkthrough, I mean, of your journey. And I think it's super interesting for those who are listening, I suppose, like how you started, like you said, with that kind of business kind of finance route and going and working in the city and like, I suppose, what are your reflections now on that young 18-year-old that was already torn? It's interesting that you were already torn at that moment between physio and business, but you still kind of did that or, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but like followed what your parents thought was best for you. And then perhaps thankfully you kind of stuck to your guns and now you're here today. But yeah, what, when you reflect on that younger Amanda, I suppose, what are your thoughts then? I do often think that I did stick to it purely because I knew it was the parents wishes and I think 
when I was 18, especially like that's 21 years ago, you know, it's like a long time ago. You kind of didn't like stick with your parents a bit more then than yeah. I think 18 year olds would now, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've reflected on that a lot because it's quite a sliding doors moment in careers. Like if I'd stayed in the city, life would be very different now to the life I do have. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm glad I actually did do that degree first because I do think if I'd done physio at 18, I would have always wondered what a life in business would have been like as well. Yeah. Um, and it would have been harder to swap that way around. So I think mm-hmm. this way... I know what that other side was like and yep. I know that that isn't the lifestyle I wanted, um, which has made me actually probably be more content as a physio and more yeah. enthusiastic and passionate about my job because I know it is where I really want to be. Yeah, I love that. I, I, and I mean, I think that speaks a lot as well to like having no regrets and just actually trying things so like a lot of people have no idea what they want to do whether it's their jobs in profession or personally and I think there's just it sounds so cliche but just actually trying things and actually seeing how you feel they go you know is massive like if you try like a job like I when I first left university um my initially I took my degree as accounting and finance and then thankfully swapped it uh, second year to business management because I have a kind of a strong fascination with people But even when I left university, I went into like an accounts intern role and I absolutely hated it. And that, but for me, that was the best thing I could have done because there's so many roles in the world of business, like accounting is at least what, 20% of all business roles. So after that six month internship or three month internship, I could just discount 20% of business roles. And then I knew where else to look for, for jobs. So like a bit for you as well, like you got to try it. You've got to see what the reality is like, which is what I try and do this podcast for. And then you're like, okay, I've tried it now. That's not me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down this route, you know? So, yeah. I really agree. And I think um, I was reading something recently about are you driven more by a goal or materialistic or your morals and beliefs? And I think for me, actually, my career was more about where my passion lies rather than mm. um, which would have been the more, I guess, typical successful career if you're looking at financial position or yeah rise up a ladder to a ceo or a partner in a big business firm actually for me it was more important that i loved my job and i Mm. enjoyed going to it every day and i had that passion Mm. than it was just being successful in a job that i hated yeah yeah and even even when you you know like for those who aren't can't can't see it visually even when you said the word success like yes it's successful but successful in what right and successful to who like yes it's successful to society but if it's not successful to you and it doesn't make you know don't get me wrong there's nuance you have to pay your bills there's also just because you didn't want that life doesn't mean you like uh, travel or other experiences which cost money so there's always a balance but for you success meant a completely different thing rather than you know, being another cog or a different title in, in in a firm. And that's, that's. I think the more and more we can make people more comfortable with that, you know, the the, the greater kind of people's satisfaction is. Uh, and I suppose on that, that basis, you, you know, you've kind of, you then took that pivot to physiotherapy. You then had kind of a, a kind of a strong foundation in the NHS, I suppose, before moving to private practice. What would you say are some of like the big differences you found? I'm sure it probably was a bit of a shock to the system initially doing private. What were what were some of the the big differences of like NHS to, to private? Um, well, I'm very lucky because privately I'm also self-employed, so I can dictate my clinic list more than if you were just employed in the private sector. Yeah. Um, if you're employed in a private hospital, there's probably not many differences between that and NHS clinic roles. But mm-hmm. in a, your own clinic, the flexibility is huge compared to anything in the NHS. Um, And just actually having the power to control your diary. So an NHS day for an outpatient physio would be 14 patients and a 30-minute lunch break, roughly after 10 patients. So you're quite a a heavy morning, short break, short afternoon. You're exhausted. You're out of there. Done. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And actually, it's very, very um, protocol-driven nowadays. When I started, it was probably less so, but especially nowadays, um 
and less autonomy than you used to have nowadays. So when I first worked in outpatients in the NHS, it was still very much our decision on how many appointments to see someone for or what treatment modality to use and you make the best treatment plan given your experience. Unfortunately, the NHS can't sustain yeah. that sort of service for people now. Um, so it is very much more outcome driven. You know, people can only have a couple of sessions and actually you can't use certain modalities because that relies on more sessions and you can't mm. give that in the NHS budgets now. So actually, I think the biggest difference for me and the reason I love private work still now and struggle to go back across to the NHS now is that I know I can do whatever is necessary to give that patient the goal that they want to achieve. So if I need to see someone five times, I can. Mm -hmm. If I yep. only need to see them once, I can see them once. But I have that complete flexibility. And I think yep. that's probably the biggest difference and the biggest benefit, really, is that mm -hmm. you have complete flexibility and you get all of your patients are on board with treatment. All of your patients want to get better. In the NHS, there's a lot more complex issues, different socio-demographic groups, different complexities that mean that not all patients necessarily at that point want to be at physio. Some may yeah. feel they've been fobbed off by their GP or some may feel they're not being listened to, whereas privately, 100% of your patients are on board. And that's, yeah. again, a really big difference. Um, and it's, it is really nice. It makes your job easier. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it, it does just give you a bit more freedom to do what you know is best for somebody. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, I mean, firstly, kind of thank you for kind of sharing that. And I think what I draw out of that, also working like in the NHS for six years, and funny enough, we, we actually... We, I think we only figured this out when I when I kind of first saw you that we actually went to the same organisation yes. at some point. Um, but the NHS, the biggest thing I draw out of it is like that patient centred focus that the NHS has, and through you know no right or wrong, I suppose it's because of budgets and all the rest of it. That approach has had to be more um, kind of linked to budgets, and that almost sometimes contests with that patient centred view. You know what you what you actually would be doing best for the patient and what you've shared I suppose and for those who listen who want to enter physiotherapy but then maybe are looking at private practice and would that be a career route for them that that's quite alleviating I suppose illuminating I should say because you can still have that kind of patient centered focus but then you have more flexibility and autonomy to actually deliver on that I suppose rather than no you're only allowed three appointments regardless if they need one or 15 um, yes. and at least you would hope in this means they, they have the means I suppose to get, get that treatment so it, it's really interesting to hear how like the, the differences between the practices and on the differences I suppose to go like a step further this is always a bit of a tricky question for people to answer but like if you were to think about say your average week as yes. like both a physio for you said physio rooms and, and the free rivers golf club what what would an average week look like for you do you think so i now work four days a week which is a perfect balance for me for life with two young kids obviously and also mm -hmm. because my hands get tired out now because i've been yep. doing it for so long um so i work three days in the normal clinic the msk outpatient clinic mm -hmm. um and on average I would probably now do somewhere between 10 and 12 patients a day there mm -hmm. and then one day a week at the golf clinic. So the standard clinic is a real mix. I see sports injuries. I see just chronic problems of low back pain they've had for years and years and years and they just need a bit of help with it. Post-op patients, so after a hip replacement, a knee replacement, things like that, or like tendon issues, repetitive mm -hmm. use. So it's a real mixed bag and a real mixed age group. So I will see children. Um, the youngest I've ever seen in the last, well, probably in the last 18 months, the youngest has been two years old. So, wow. and then up to, I've got a 96-year-old that I saw today. So, you know, we've got a <laughs> wide range and a wide range of like activity and hobby base so it's really varied really varied clinic and then the one day a week in the golf clinic is again very varied and very different from my other clinic it's obviously all more sports based 
but it yeah. will be injury rehab. It could be preventing injury. It could be biomechanic screening just to see how the body's moving, as you know, and um, how we can move it better or what's stopping us from moving it better. Um, or I do some Pilates, some fitness stuff, strength and conditioning. So it's very much more a sports-based active job that one day. Um, yeah. And it's nice. And I love the contrast. And I'm so pleased I have that contrast because equally four days of just um, normal clinic is tiring. Yeah. Whereas yeah. that break of doing biomechanical screens or a bit of fitness or a bit of Pilates, it keeps it exciting and it's a bit of a lighter day on my hands as well. So, yeah, yeah. Cause you, it, it's interesting. Like you said, even with the MSK, like 10 to 12 patients, like a day, like, I, I presume, you know, you have to be in quite physical fitness and physical condition yourself. Like, and, and that for my, obviously, being exposed to kind of clinicians, like, you do see physios as a general stereotype are quite muscular and quite kind of um, have quite good fitness because of the nature of their roles. Like, they have to be in fairly good condition themselves to just go through that workload, like, every single day. Um, and, 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 yeah, I'm just thinking it's a bit of a loose link but like some of the skills qualities and we can then maybe later go on to like educational requirements although like if you were to build a physio or if people are interested in entering this profession what do you think are some of like the prerequisites some of the skills and qualities they they need really to to kind of enter this well it's funny you say about most physios are quite athletic because we always used to say in the nhs in an MDT meeting, you could pick up the physio straight away. You'd know the way there. Like there'd be the sporty one that walks in with their trainers on or their gym clothes on. It's like, you could pick out, the, the longer you worked, you could pick out the physio, you could pick out the OT, you could pick out the speech and language therapist quite easily because we are all actually quite stereotypically mm. from the same moulds as each other. Um, yeah. So I do think there is an element of a personality fits a physio because mm -hmm. we are... We do all tend to be very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but for skills and qualities, I would say we do all tend to have a bit of a passion for exercising and be quite active ourselves because I think that's how most people get into it from a sport or an injury themselves. And that's what sparked my initial passion. I injured my hip in sport and I had physio to mm -hmm. recover from it and that's what opened that door for me really um so definitely some sort of sporty interest or activity um otherwise other than the academic skills it really is good communication um empathy compassion yep. for those patients because a lot of the time patients see you and they're vulnerable you know they're injured a lot of them are worried. A lot of people have health anxiety, which I think has got worse since COVID. Like people are really concerned um, and they want to feel listened to and reassured a lot of the time. Uh, and if you can build that rapport with any patient, you're going to be successful in treating them because yeah. they trust you and they will yeah. believe you. So I think, yes, to be honest, I think a passion for the human body and activity and then being quite empathetic and have good compassion and listening is probably the the best skill mix. Yeah, no, I, I, and I thank you for kind of sharing that. And I think like the communication bit can't be like understated, I suppose, enough, like, or over, can't be overstated enough, really, because if you have good communication skills, you know, different people have different intellects and speak in different ways and all the rest of it. But it, it must be super helpful for you if you can communicate with someone and they can articulate the issue, the symptoms and exactly what they're feeling, because that must allow you to treat, diagnose it like much more quicker and much more accurately, I suppose. Um, yeah. But that communication, I suppose, like it, it's almost boring when people switch off and go, yeah, yeah, interpersonal skills, I get it. But that, yes, you need to have a passion and interest, but that's probably a really fundamental skill that you do like almost every appointment. I suppose. I agree. And one of my first ever lectures I went to at uni, I remember the lecturer saying, and it stuck with me for my whole career, to be a good physio, you need to be able to listen and communicate. Because if you mm. listen to the patient, they will tell you what is wrong, but they will yep. also tell you how to fix it if you listen for long enough. Because they will say, 
even if it's respiratory, they'll say my breathing's easier when I do X, Y and Z or my ankle doesn't hurt when it's in these positions. And automatically yeah. you then know how to, to do your treatment, basically, and which way is going to be best. Mm. And they said without the good listening and the good communication, you will always struggle. And I think it's so true. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And and then on the educational route, I suppose, like you obviously did kind of your degree um, or your secondary degree, I should say, in that physio space and then did kind of built a bit of work experience and then obviously transitioned to where you are now. For people transitioning, wanting to like enter the world of physiotherapy, what what would do you think your be a suggestion be around educational requirements? Is it just simply most people need to go down the degree route? What 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 is like the path I suppose people need to take? Do you think? So it is still heavily degree route based. There is <laughs> now apprenticeship coming to light, but it's not very well established yet, and not many. Unfortunately, healthcare for clinician pay- basis mm-hmm. are quite hard to change so people mm-hmm. you know they still think the best route is you must have that degree and you must do x y and z so mm-hmm. at the moment the traditional route would still be degree although i think give it maybe 10 years because we're going to be slower than other industries yep. and apprenticeships yep. will be more widely available but yeah. right now it's degree yeah predominantly. And I think that's good to know i think like the hard lines or the red lines for some of these professions I suppose if people have degrees already like you did you know can they do kind of transferable ones to kind of get onto courses or you know do they need to then under uh, undertake different things around the GCSEs and A levels to make sure they meet the requirements to, to hit a degree so I think it's a good thing for people when they're looking at their options rather than spending loads and loads of time and, and getting invested in them and unfortunately it's a route they can't go under I think that that's it's really helpful for people just to know kind of for, you know at, at the forefront. Um, yeah and and I would say at the moment definitely anyone looking to go into it Mm. look at degree route and then the A-level requirements are tough still so it's A-A-B or Mm A-B-B and there has to be a science or PE as one of those A-levels yes yeah yeah that's interesting because I and, and I know a good friend actually who is looking to enter the world of physiotherapy uh, himself at, at, at up at a university and he did like he went to college and did like a, a a kind of university degree via college which was like sports science and stuff like that yeah. so I think that's he has a way of using that course to kind of transfer almost into yeah. it as well so that's that's quite interesting to, to know and obviously that's more what we'd say maybe like at the baseline for physiotherapy yeah. but then you you spoke at the beginning around also some additional qualifications almost specializing into golf uh, I suppose yes. so what tell me a bit more about what you had to do in terms of in that so generally speaking with a physio career your learning's never over and your CPD well it's compulsory anyway to do a certain amount of hours or a year if we're ever asked to screen. So we're always doing courses. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, that's just what course you fancy. There's no particular courses you have to do other than your, you know, your standard manual handling, NHS, yeah. basic life support stuff. Um, but I chose golf. So I did mine through a, it's called the Titleist Performance Institutes, the TPI, mm-hmm. who are based in America. And they do a lot of work with golf professionals. They do do it with, golf pros so we golf like instructors as well but also mm-hmm. more looking at your fitness industry and your medical industry and your youth sport industry um and they're the only body to really offer a medical pathway for people interested in golf um mm. and that at the time was in covid so i would have it would have been a face to face course but actually it was um via zoom annoyingly on a us time zone so I was up at the middle of the night to do my exam because the exam was online (laughs) at like 2 a.m or something which was awful Um, (laughs) but yeah it was a series of lectures and then exam at the end Um, and then it's the same for the second stage of the medical level I haven't done the third stage um, because of covid it has to be face to face your third stage and then they've only just started doing the face-to-face courses again um but yeah so that was all golf specific all for medical practitioners but that was physio and osteo and chiropractor so you could be any of the three to go into that course yeah Um, 
And you see that a lot. I get asked that a lot by people. What's the difference between physios, osteopaths, chiropractors? Yep. Which one would be the best route for someone to take? So if they really knew they wanted to work in sport or outpatients or am I better being a physio, an osteo or a chiropractor? In short, it depends what country you're based in. Mm -hmm. So UK, Australia, physio in sport is still preferred. Yep. Uh, in other countries, osteo or chiropractor are equal. Okay. So, yeah. oh, okay, that's interesting. And, and as you touch on them, it'll be interesting because I've had osteopath uh, like explain to me about 10 times and I still don't get the difference and still don't understand it. But um, I, I know there's a bit, a bit of muscles and bones and that, but yeah, t talk us through what, what would you say are the difference between those, those three kind of paths or professions? So generally speaking, physio gives you, um, you can work across more areas. So osteopaths will generally only work with musculoskeletal industry, injury. So okay. that'll be any muscular or spinal or skeletal problems. Um, whereas physio will do any of the medical areas as well. So we'll work on intensive care, stroke, neurology, rehab, orthopedics and post-op work. And I would say on a basic line, osteopaths are more manual therapy trained. So mm -hmm. they do a lot more of the clicking and the deep massage. Mm -hmm. Whereas physios will do hands-on but they are more rehab to more get you back to doing an activity based. So yeah. osteo will do a manual treatment to the area. Physio mm -hmm. traditionally may do that as well, but they'll do more exercise rehab as well as that. Right. Okay. And that, that, that feels even more present and common in the current day with the NHS dealing with kind of increased capacity. The biggest yes. thing you hear is like exercises that are prescribed to people. So that, and, and and then just a final one, I suppose, like chiropractor, I suppose that's more bones, is that? or Yeah, what? it's yeah, it's more um, bone-based still mm -hmm. and very much more... Um, osteopaths would be more popular in the UK if you were training in the UK. There's more schools for it. Yeah. Chiros are more... It was really big in South Africa, so there's a lot coming mm -hmm. over from South Africa, but the States as well. But, yeah, it's just very much yeah. bony, you know, like a, a, a skeleton issue yes um, yeah no, no that that makes sense. and for, for me like and I, i've always said this and with the kind of the nursing industry it feels like you can get into nursing it'd be interesting to take to hear your take for physios because you can get into like being a i suppose a general nurse and you kind of cover lots of different disciplines and then from there you can gain a bit of expertise and almost an interest in certain areas and then look to maybe specialize down one route do you see that in terms of it, from what you said, it sounds like physio is a bit more broad. You can kind of cover more areas. Do you see a lot of people enter the world of physiotherapy, then gain a particular interest in an area? Yours, perhaps, for, you know, obviously is in sport and a specific sport in terms of golf. But even in terms of the, the type of injury or type of things you deal with, do physios then go maybe osteopaths or chiropractors? Because they, they really have a, an interest in that area, I suppose. So they don't tend to switch on title, but they mm -hmm. do just tend to treat more in that kind of way so right. for example if someone is more keen through osteopathy they would do more msk clinics and do a lot more spinal injury like spinal pain clinics yeah. and would treat in a more similar way to an osteopath so they'd be nice. rare to swap over um but they would just tailor their treatments in that in that way yeah. more yeah yeah that that that's that makes it and for me that's quite exciting to hear again depends what you like to do but for me I love kind of variety and like options and freedom and all that really speaks strongly to me so to be able to have that that broad foundation and then once I find an interest in certain areas I can almost tailor my my workflow to that you know that that's almost a positive like that would be draw that would draw me into the industry so yeah now that's yeah. thank you for kind of sharing that the but options go on, go on. are absolutely endless really once you're in you can go, and it's it, the golf, for example, has been like that for me. You know, I can really get into the golf now, and I do love it so much. But I can also do the other things as well. And actually, mm. if in five years from now, I think I love the golf, but I want to do more with, like, in academy golf or the youngsters, you know, you can just do that. Or, again, mm. equally, I could think, well, no, I've now worked with the young golfers. I want to work in academy football and just switch again. Yeah. You know, it's it's a job where you can 
actually quite easily as long as you're willing to put the hours in to get up to speed in the next sports world you can switch yes. as often as you want really it's a very flexible yeah. career and that, that that I think that's that thank you for kind of sharing that I think that's again like if you're wanting to have that openness I suppose in terms of what path you do or you get bored easily or you want to constantly learn and develop and stuff like that then obviously that's another pull to kind of enter in this this kind of world so yeah that's you know that's quite cool to hear and then I think what would be interesting as well now I suppose we've mentioned kind of the different things you do and the different kind of uh, professions and um, how you can kind of change and all the rest of it and that'll be interesting I suppose to find out what are perhaps most the most rewarding and maybe even the most challenging aspects of maybe not just physio but your role and, and where you are currently I suppose so rewarding is easy because it's a job that basically constantly gives you a feel-good factor each day like every single clinic in fact I can't think of a single clinic in the last five years where you haven't made a difference to someone that day you know yeah you've yeah taken away a fear or you've got them back to doing something they really wanted to do or their golf games improved or they've managed to even something easy with someone who's been post-op you know they're off their crutches and they're delighted and you know that you've influenced that so the yeah. rewards if it's a if you're someone who likes to work for reward physio rewards come thick and fast you know every yeah. day yeah. you feel like you've made a difference to someone and you can't deny that that's an incredible part of the job. So yeah. you always know that. Um, challenges in general, if you're NHS-based or even inpatient-based at all, it's a much different story to if you're outpatient-based. So inpatients, obviously, one, you deal with much more serious illnesses. So you've got the emotional challenges you don't patients don't always get better you know and like yep. in intensive care you often aren't going to keep that patient alive or they are going to pass um but actually if that isn't something you can deal with then you don't have to be in that area so you can yep. you can know very quickly if that's not suited to you challenges in my world uh in general clinic is that my patients although they're 100 percent on board with physio they are less likely to stick to their exercise plan because they would quite like me to just fix them, which is yeah. fine. <laughs> like, yeah. You can still do that. It would just be nice if they did do the exercises you taught them, yeah. but it's fine. Um, yeah. That's probably the biggest challenge. Um, or in golf, again, it's that they hear multiple different things. The golf pro is telling them one thing, you're telling them another thing, and it's to try and sing off the same hymn sheet and work as a team. Um in golf, the position of a medic amongst a golfer's team is still quite a new concept. So yeah. quite a few golf pros in particular, um, not resistant to physios working with their clients, but I don't think they're still quite sure how that physio is helping if there's not an injury. Um, yeah. And that's an area that just needs to develop in that particular sports world. It's way behind other sports in that regard. Um like obviously football have had physios at, in every team for decades, you know, it's just, yeah. it's an industry that's always been a bit more, um, I don't know even how I would describe it, but, you know, it's not as open to yeah. other yeah. professionals being involved or other ideas coming into it. Yeah, I, I think I think you've, you've read it in a great way. I think like the modernisation of the game, I suppose, um, it has come at a slightly different pace to, to other games. And, uh, you know, it, you can see how it's changing and it's had massive leaps and bounds in terms of being a much more appealing and cool sport. I think in COVID, it was one of the highest growing sports. Yeah. Um, once people kind of actually started it, they realised actually forget all the snobbery and all the kind of stuff that, that people associate with it. You know, you're just walking around in, a, in an open space with your friends, like hitting the ball about. Um, and you can only look at like the North. So you look at Northern areas. If we were to say about snobbery, you look at kind of um, Scotland, a lot of Liverpool, a lot of areas, uh, Manchester, you know, a lot of kind of predominantly sometimes poor areas. It's a massive up, kind of uptake with golf as well. So it's not as elitist as perhaps yes. it, it can be perceived as, I suppose. So, I, I think I think you're, you're you're bang on, and I think it's you know I think again this podcast is always to share the kind of the key realities of industries, so it's nice to kind of get under it 
and and you can see that at the professional level i think kind of medics in in terms of physios in golf are now being much more widely adopted and biomechanics i forgot the chap's name but but biomechanics is is kind of part and parcel now of yes. especially the the kind of ball speed and the whole Athlete, uh, athletes now in golf and hitting the ball further that's that's like if you're not doing it you're left behind and I suppose usually in most professions you see the the professionals will undertake something and then it will slowly kind of fall down to grassroots so I, I can I can see that in five ten years whenever it may be it'll be more and more even in your local golf clubs it'll be more and more adopted it's just yeah just how long it takes for that to be more widespread I suppose so, yeah. yeah, definitely. And I'd say that is a challenge in any sports area, you know, the the role of the physio. And it will equally, if you were in the football, the role of the physio, you're still saying things different to the the coach or the manager wants different things. Yeah. It is, that is the role in sport. There's always going to be slight conflict because you're all wanting a different outcome. For me, I might say to a golfer, actually, I don't want you to play for a week because... yeah. You need to get this sorted, but they yeah. want to be at the range every day for an yeah. hour, two hours at a time. Yeah. And the coach is saying, well, you need to really practice this drill. And we're yeah. all conflicted and it's no different in any sport. Um, and it's yeah. just, again, it comes back to good communication, both with the other professionals involved and the the patient that you're treating. Yeah. Um, and I guess that just highlights again that communication across the board is one of the key skills. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, no. And and I suppose as we kind of start tonight, turn the, the podcast and, and c- come to a bit of a close, like, you know, thank you for sharing your, your kind of history and your experience and your journey of the physio world. And hopefully that's helped listeners just have a little bit of a window into it. Uh, and, and especially almost at the different professions and the different routes you can take. But I suppose if you, and, and it's always a tricky question to ask, but if you had your time again, and you were that maybe that eighteen year old Amanda, or you were entering the world of physiotherapy again. I suppose what what would you perhaps maybe do differently if you had your your time again? It's a really tough question because, and I say to everyone that I love my career so much. I would never change career. I would always be a physio. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I know that outpatients is where I want to be. So I know that I did my rotations. I chose the correct specialist specialism Mm -hmm. um but I would say the thing I would do differently is almost bleed the knowledge out of the consultants more than I ever did so when you're a junior um consultants don't like to give you answers they tell you to look things up yourself or find things out and I think just as a physio you don't then ask the questions because it's not really when I trained it's it's medicine still not much better it's not a yeah. culture where knowledge is passed down freely it's kind mm-hmm. of a, well it took me 10 years to figure that out you yeah. go figure it out yourself but I yeah. wish I hadn't I had just asked the questions more you know taken more knowledge from others um and not been worried about asking those questions um yeah. and I could I a lot of my decisions were made around my family. So I have like had a young family. Mm -hmm. Um, But if I didn't, my advice to anyone else, or if I didn't have that young family at the start would be to travel and chop and change between trusts more because again, healthcare, whether we like to admit it or not, there is still postcode lottery healthcare going on. So the, the pathways in Broomfield would be very different to the London hospitals. And I just think sometimes it would be good not to do all of your junior years in one area Mm. and chop and change between. And equally, chop and change between sports. Don't just stick for longer. I think I was quite bad at just being like, right, well, I'm in this trust. I'm going to do all of my rotations in one trust. And then I want to do this and this and this. And it was quite linear. Whereas I think actually physio travel take the locum jobs in other areas just get more experience and exposure to different areas yeah no I I I completely kind of like agree even for myself from a completely different world I think if I had my time again I would have worked um done almost more work experience and worked in smaller organizations so um it's not quite the same in terms of like you know the trust and stuff 
but it's it's trying to get the same thing. It's trying to get a basic variety. Yeah, and, a and, broader. You know, a broader kind of skill set like because if I'm a small organization I'm the cleaner the salesman the marketeer I'm, I'm everything and like you said with your one not just trained in one process but one way you're trained in different routes different practices across different trusts so yeah no, yeah. I really like that. yeah yeah and, and I do and, think a breadth of knowledge is just as important as like you can gain yeah. your depth later on but at the start if right. I had my time again that's what I would do try and get more exposure in different areas Yes, yeah, yeah, no, for sure, and 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 I suppose you know also speaking to a reality of people, they might be in different life states and all the rest of it. But if people are younger and they are listening to this, and you know they're living at home or whatever it is, they haven't got a family, you know, having whether we like it or not, less financial constraints, you know, allows us even more greater flexibility to really, yes. you know, take a risk. You know, there's a common perception that you know by the time you're 25 you should be a millionaire and have a rolex and have all this you know the yeah. the bugatti and all the rest of it whereas realistically those years uh, and uh, uh, gary v more and more kind of articulates this your 20s and 30s are just to try a load of stuff do as much things as possible and then it's actually really your late 30s and 40s where you really actually kind of double down on that career and then you can start earning money and then compensating for all the skills you've learned whereas the 20s and 30s are actually for learning not not actually what well, i need to get in the job and kind of get up the career ladder already and earn my money so it, it, I think it's good to hear more and more the people I talk, regardless of the industry, they all share that kind of common sentiment around, you know, flexibility. And I wish I tried different things and quicker. So yeah, yeah no, thank you. But thank you for sharing Definitely. that. Definitely, you're yeah. welcome. And and I suppose my, my final question before we kind of kind of uh, close the day, I suppose, is is there anything that we haven't covered that you know you you think we we should we need to discuss or or do you think we've given a, a kind of a, an overview of of the world of uh, kind of physiotherapy no i think it's probably given a good overview i would just say the physio world is always quite small in the uk so you know contacts you make always keep because mm. you cross them over and over and over again and you just never know what opportunities they're going to give you and there's some fantastic opportunities out there across sport everything you know startups new pathways in the nhs you know it's such a varied career that yeah. yeah you can always make it more exciting if you want to no that's that's cool and and i suppose if, if people are interested in the physiotherapy world or or bare enough they even have an injury and they want to get like they need support and stuff like that where, where's the best place to find you and, and all that you do um so it's best to find me uh i am on instagram um mm -hmm. and that's my golf physio one so that's golf underscore physio underscore uk mm -hmm. or email um we my physio rooms is on facebook so it's the physio rooms or website the physio rooms dot co dot uk Perfect. And I'll, I'll be sure to include kind of links and contacts in the show notes so, so anybody can kind of uh, contact Amanda, um, regardless of kind of if they require physio or, or maybe yeah. just want to learn a bit more about, about entering the, the industry or the world. So, yeah, f f thank you so much for your, your time, Amanda. Well, thank um, you for inviting me along. That's no problem at all. No problem at all. And, and I, hopefully uh, you all kind of enjoyed that in terms of the listeners. Again, another industry um, sharing about the realities of, of entering the profession. Uh, and I hope to see you all on the next episode of Catapult Your Career.